Hi, I'm Alex, and welcome to Palio Rewind 2020, a cross-channel collaboration put together by Edge, in which 12 natural history YouTubers are covering paleontological discoveries and research published over the past year. We're taking on a month of discoveries each on our own channels. My segment is on August. If you haven't already, check out Dylan's video on July at the Palio Archive. So without further ado, let's get started. Bad to the Bone Pathologies are among the most helpful things we can find in fossils, since they tell us how an organism's body was affected by disease, providing fascinating details about the hardships that individual extinct animals suffer during their lives. Among non-avian dinosaurs, pathologies have been identified in specimens from all major groups, including theropods, ceratopsians, sauropodomorphs, stegosaurs, ankylosaurs, ornithopods, and pachycephalosaurs. One type of pathology that we had yet to unambiguously diagnose, however, was cancer, an infamous group of diseases characterized by uncontrolled cell growth. This year, however, we finally got the first definitively confirmed case of malignant cancer in a non-avian dinosaur. Researchers described a fibula, or calf bone, from the late Cretaceous ceratopsian species Centrosaurus apertus, known from the Dinosaur Park formation in Canada. What was previously thought to be a callus from a healed injury on the fibula was re-examined and identified as a large osteosarcoma, or bone tumor, shown here in yellow surrounding the healthy part of the fibula. The tumor was extensive enough to indicate that the animal had it for a significant portion of its life, perhaps long enough for it to have spread to other parts of the body. The describers noted that in a human, a bone tumor as severe as that seen in this particular Centrosaurus would be fatal. Iberian Sailbacks Fossils of many dinosaur groups are known from early Cretaceous deposits in the Iberian Peninsula, but the most common are those of Spinosaurids, a famously crocodile-like family of sailbacked, mostly fish-eating semi-aquatic theropods. Paleontologists described 12 spinosaur teeth from the Cameros Basin in La Rioja, Spain. Though at least three spinosaur genera are previously known from the country, including Baryonyx, Camarillosaurus, and the recently named Vallebona venatrix, these new teeth weren't assigned to a particular genus or species. They were, however, identified as belonging to indeterminate Baryonychines. Baryonychines are the more terrestrial subfamily of Spinosaurids that includes animals like Baryonyx and Suchomimus. The teeth, along with previously unearthed skeletal remains, indicate that there were up to three distinct Baryonychines in the Enciso group of La Rioja, including an indeterminate Baryonyx species. It is also apparent that the more aquatic and derived Spinosaurians like Vallebona venatrix coexisted with such Baryonychines. Though fragmentary, these new findings bolster the known diversity of Iberian Spinosaurs and support the presence of a land bridge between Europe and Gondwana during the early Cretaceous. Additionally, the sediments the teeth were discovered in represent an environment of rivers and lakes, further supporting that Spinosaurids lived in freshwater habitats near coastal or marine regions. Dino Sloth vs. Crocosaurus in another instance of a fossil animal that had its leg damaged in life, a tibia, or shin bone, from the ground sloth Pseudoprepatherium, hailing from the Pebas formation in the Amazon rainforest, preserves evidence of having been bitten into by a gigantic extinct caiman. This particular caiman was Purusaurus, a behemoth of a crocodilian that probably reached up to 10.9 meters in length when fully grown. It lived in the wetlands of prehistoric South America during the Miocene, between 20 to 5 million years ago, and would have been an apex predator in its ecosystem. Given the size of the bite marks penetrating the Pseudoprepatherium tibia, however, it appears that the Purusaurus that attacked the sloth was either a juvenile or subadult, around 4 meters long. The pattern of the lesions indicates the crocodilian may have lunged at its prey and grabbed onto its leg to capture it and its jaws. However, 
Since only the leg bone of the pseudoperpetherium is known, there's also the possibility that the sloth was dismembered. This discovery provides a better picture of how this caiman's diet changed at different stages of its life, suggesting that young Porosaurus probably fed mostly on small, capybara-sized land animals. Once adults, however, their massively powerful bite force would allow them to dispatch tougher prey, including giant mammals and large turtles. Little Titans Moving on to one of the most adorable finds of the year, an astonishing fossil from Argentina preserves the skull of a sauropod embryo. The specimen, found in an unknown region of Patagonia and illegally exported from the country, was prepared and eventually repatriated to an Argentine museum. It consists of a partial sediment-filled egg, preserving only the skull of an unhatched titanosaurian sauropod. Titanosaurs were a widespread and diversified group of sauropods, including some of the largest land animals to have ever lived, such as Argentinosaurus, Patagotitan, and Portasaurus. As impressive as they were in adulthood, however, these sky-high behemoths, like all dinosaurs, came from humble beginnings. This particular baby titanosaur skull measures only a few centimeters in length. The most intriguing feature of the skull is how the front extends into a long snout with a horn-like tip. Previously thought to represent some sort of rhino-like horn that was present in baby sauropods but lost in adults, it is now considered more likely to be an egg tooth. Egg teeth are peculiar structures known in many modern egg-laying animals, including most reptiles. They come in the shape of a temporary little protuberance on the tip of a baby's snout, which is used to aid in breaking out of the eggshell from the inside when it's time to hatch. A river dragon for sure. Spinosaurus had a semi-aquatic lifestyle, of that there is no doubt as multiple lines of direct and indirect evidence have been used to corroborate this, including crocodilian-like jaws and teeth for feeding on aquatic prey, retracted nostrils, four-toed feet with flat claws for walking on unsteady ground, compact bone tissue for buoyancy control, proportionately small hind limbs, and a deep, fin-like tail for underwater propulsion. The isotopic composition of Spinosaurus teeth also resembles that of modern aquatic animals like crocs and hippos, and direct evidence of fish feeding is known from relatives like baryonyx. As if all that wasn't enough, the aquatic model has also now been reinforced by taphonomy, the study of what happens to an animal's remains between death and fossilization. Two sites at a new locality in the Ifezouan and Aufus formations of Morocco have been described representing a fluvial environment of rivers and streams. Dinosaurs, like many reptiles, shed and replace their teeth throughout their lives. These two sites are chock full of teeth from Spinosaurus and denticles from the sawfish-like Sclerorhynchid on Capristes. Remarkably, the Spinosaurus teeth here were found to compose almost half of all vertebrate fossil teeth known from both sites vastly outnumbering those of more terrestrial dinosaurs and even some other aquatic animals. These findings indicate that Spinosaurus was an extremely aquatic animal that spent most of its time in and around the water, which shed many of its teeth so they would naturally be preserved in large quantities. And thus we now possess even more compelling evidence that this unique theropod was a true dragon of the swamps. Alrighty, so that pretty much wraps up what I have to say about Paleo Research in August. Hope you enjoyed! Be on the lookout for Jimmy's video on September, coming out tomorrow on Dinosaurs Will Always Be Awesome. Links to all the channels taking part in Paleo Rewind 2020 are in the description. Happy Holidays to you all, and see you again on Edge this 1st of January for the final Paleo Rewind compilation video.